Hey guys, welcome back. This is going to be Comlex Level 3 High Yield Facts Part 3. Uh, same disclaimers as always, this video is primarily for the Comlex Level 3. That being said, a lot of the information is also high yield for the USMLE Step 3. Uh, and the second disclaimer is that this is primarily information that I got from my study resources. There may be other study resources out there that have di different recommendations for treatments and other things like that. Um, so please just use what you're studying. This is only one source. All right, so let's just go ahead and get started here. Medications that cause drug-induced lupus erythematosus. There's four of them that you need to know. It's going to be isoniazid, hydralazine, procainamide, and quinidine. There are some other medications out there, but these are the big four that you want to know. What coagulation test is elevated in hemophilia A? Remember, this is a factor VIII deficiency, and you're going to see an elevation in PTT. Treatment of gastrointestinal stromal tumors, GIST. Treatment here is going to be imatinib. This is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and this hopefully is familiar to you. It is also used to treat uh, Philadelphia chromosome positive uh, CML. So imatinib is used for treatment of gastrointestinal stromal tumors as well as Philadelphia chromosome pro positive CML. Treatment of sporotrichosis is going to be oral itraconazole. Make sure that you remember it's oral. It is not a topical thing because sporotrichosis can present with skin lesions, but you need to treat them orally. Blank is the most common cause of glomerulonephritis worldwide. This is going to be IgA nephropathy. What three tendons make up the borders of the anatomic snuff box? You're going to have to dig back into your uh, first year medical school anatomy for this one. It's going to be the extensor pollicis longus, the extensor pollicis brevis, and the abductor pollicis longus. Some people say this is a brevis sandwich because the brevis is the one in the middle and there's two longus on the outside. Whatever helps you to remember it, just remember uh, the composition of the anatomic snuff box. Symptoms of lead toxicity. Hearing loss, speech delay, and pica. Remember, that's going to be uh, where children are like having a fiction for eating ice or eating sand. Uh, a classic vignette here is a child who's living in a very old home, and there's like chipped paint on the walls, and the child's been eating the paint, and that's how they're getting the lead toxicity, and they uh, typically have these symptoms. San Joaquin Valley is associated with blank. This is just biz buzz stuff, and the uh, association here is going to be coccidioidomycosis. Remember, that's the uh, southwestern part of the United States. They may even give you a vignette where there was an earthquake or something like that recently, and it brought a lot of dust up into the air, and now patients are having these respiratory symptoms. They want you to think about coccidioidomycosis. And if they say San Joaquin Valley specifically, same thing. The three most common bacterial causes of acute otitis media, and this is in order, it's going to be Haemophilus influenza, Strep pneumo, and Moraxella catarrhalis. This is very high yield. You definitely need to know this, uh, especially when they ask the pediatric questions. Blank is defined as a defect in the pars interarticularis. For some reason, I always had a hard time remembering this because there's all the different terms. It's spondylolysis. Not spondylolopsis, not spondylolisthesis, it's spondylolysis. So make sure you have that down. Blank deficiency is associated with alopecia and neuropathies. That's going to be vitamin B7, also known as biotin. Please, please make sure that you know both of the names for all of the different vitamins. Vitamin B7 is also known as biotin. That would be a super silly reason to get a question wrong. So make sure you know both the names. Microscopic necrotizing polyarteritis, that's a mouthful, is associated with blank, and that's going to be P. anca, polyarteritis P. anca. Recommended weight gain for a pregnant patient with a normal BMI is typically going to be 25 to 35 pounds. I have gotten questions that literally asked exactly that. Pretty, pretty out of left field, but something to know. Pregnant patient, normal BMI, healthy amount of weight to gain is about 25 to 35 pounds, generally. Tumor marker associated with colorectal cancer. They are going to have tumor markers like this on the exam. The one you need to know for colorectal cancer is carcinoembryonic antigen, also known as CEA. Continuing with that, the tumor marker associated with ovarian cancer is going to be CA125, and the tumor marker associated with pancreatic cancer is going to be CA19-9. 
Those three are high yield. They may give you the diagnosis and then ask you the tumor marker associated, or they may give you the tumor marker and ask you what the diagnosis is. So make sure that you have those memorized. What is fetor hepaticus? Very weird thing. It's a sweet fecal odor of the breath associated with liver disease. Never seen this in clinical practice. I'm sure somebody out there has, but just know it. Temporal arteritis is frequently associated with what condition? And that's going to be polymyalgia rheumatica. And the reason here is they share, uh, I believe they share the same HLA subtype, the same human leukocyte antigen subtype, and they're both associated with an elevated ESR. So that is also important to know. So temporal arteritis, if they're giving you a female in her like 40s to 50s with headache and jaw pain, and she's got all this joint pain, this is the association that you need to be making. What is the most likely anatomic location for anal fissures to occur? I have seen this question as well, and you just need to know that it is the posterior midline. An anal fissure is most commonly going to present at the posterior midline. Treatment of dermatitis herpetiformis is going to be dapsone. And remember what this is. I believe I had this in a high-yield images video somewhere in the past. This is the dermatologic finding that's associated with celiac disease, dermatitis herpetiformis. Treatment for that is going to be dapsone. How long after an infection do IgA nephropathy and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis present? This is very high yield as well. IgA nephropathy is typically a few days, so it's going to be the one that presents sooner. It may even be concurrent with the infection. Post-strep glomerulonephritis, on the other hand, is going to be 10 to 14 days after. So do not be surprised. They'll give you a vignette patient was recently sick, now they're having some hematuria, they have an acute kidney injury, you need to be aware of how many days after the infection. If it's shorter course, it's IJ nephropathy. If it's been two plus weeks, you want to be thinking post-strep glomerulonephritis. A sinusoidal pattern on fetal heart rate monitoring indicates blank. Fetal heart rate monitoring is very, very high yield. You need to know the accelerations, late accelerations, early decelerations, all those different kinds of things. But a sinusoidal pattern, we want to be thinking about fetal anemia. What is the USPSTF recommendation for mammograms? This stuff is bread and butter, especially for the complex. They want you to know USPSTF recommendations. They want you to know the things that are going to be in family medicine and family care. And this recommendation is a mammogram every two years starting at age 50. I will give you a caveat here. There are different recommendations out there. I know ACOG has different recommendations. Whatever you are seeing when you're studying, just go with that. The main one from USPSTF is this every two years starting at age 50, but there are other ones that I have seen on tests out there. So try not to get tripped up by that. What should exclusively breastfed infants have supplemented? What are there? So they're being breastfed. What do they need to have supplemented in their diet? And it's going to be vitamin D. The general recommendation is 400 international units daily, and that is information that is coming from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Blank most often develops after a cervical hyperextension injury. That's going to be central cord syndrome. Let's keep moving here. The chronic pancreatitis triad is going to be diarrhea, steatorrhea. So it's the uh, you know fecal matter that has a lot of uh, fat in it, fat matter in it, uh, and it floats in the toilet and pancreatic calcifications. Remember, chronic pancreatitis, they may not even have an elevated lipase, so do not bank on that. But these are the three things that you will see, and you can see those pancreatic calcifications typically on CT scan. Renal tubular acidosis type blank is characterized by hyperkalemia. This is something that uh, all the glomerulonephropathies and all the kidney diseases were drilled in on uh, step one and complex level one, uh, and it's type four that is associated with hyperkalemia. And to go along with that, what metabolic derangement does renal tubular acidosis present with? Yes, it's an acidosis, we know that, but you need to know more than that. It's actually a non-anion gap, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. All right, what is the test of choice for diagnosis of gastric cancer? This is actually going to be an EGD. And then I believe this is the last one, criteria for receiving bariatric surgery. It's either a BMI of greater than 40, flat out by itself, or a BMI of greater than 35 with associated comorbidities, uh, diabetes being a very common one, and having failed dietary therapy. So if they give you the patient, their BMI is greater than 40, they would be a candidate for bariatric surgery. 
if their BMI is greater than 35 and they tried diet and that didn't work and they tried other medications and they have diabetes, those kinds of things will also make them a candidate for uh, bariatric surgery. So that's the end of this video. I know these uh, high yield facts videos are pretty quick and efficient. Hopefully that's useful for you guys. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to subscribe to my channel to be able to watch these videos and receive other updates about board prep and other tips for success for medical school. Thank you again and good luck studying.